But then you come into underrepresented sectors on the stock market, which are your hotels, travel and tourism industry, which are your airlines, which are your shopping malls. Now, a lot of, like there's a one particular into properties which manages a lot of malls in the UK went into bankruptcy because a lot of their malls were closed down during the pandemic. Then we have airlines as well suffering. Okay, EasyJet, and we have a couple of Ryanair, a lot of low cost carriers in the uh, in the European Union were able to recover because they provide domestic travel within the EU. When I say domestic travel, it is international, but because Europe is quite small, so let's say flights from UK to Ireland, UK to Italy, like you know, one, two, three hour flights. But a lot of international airlines, such as Cathay Pacific from Hong Kong or Singapore Airlines, were suffering because Singapore Airlines doesn't operate a domestic service. Neither does Hong Kong's Cathay Pacific. So for them, when borders are closed across the globe, they're suffering. Qantas as well. They say that they, Australia wouldn't open its borders until this summer 2021. So we have all these planes lying idle on those runways. They're not able to travel. But those are the industries that are suffering heavily. Those are the sectors suffering heavily. But because they don't represent the stock market, the rally in the stock market, especially on the S&P, S&P was up 12, 13% last year, 2020. And that is considering, taken into account, we had a pandemic, once in a century kind of a pandemic that nobody was able to price into it. Nobody was able to like, you know, call for it. Nobody was able to hedge for it. So because of this, and then due to the rally in the stock market, a lot of government yields, especially in the US treasury yields, the bond yields, they went to record low. So interest rates from government yields, government securities were so low, investors wanted to invest into something that was giving them a little bit more meat, that was giving them a little bit more of a return. So they were investing into riskier assets, such as your equity, such as your stocks, such as your other fixed income opportunities. Therefore, overall the investment by the people was just able to like supply and demand as it is at the end of the day. Macroeconomics, microeconomics, sorry. So a lot of people are just pumping in more and more money. Investors were pumping in more and more money. Therefore, the rally in the stock market. Will that rally last? Nobody really knows. I believe the rally is here to stay for a considerable time. We will have corrections. We have had corrections in the last six months or so. Every time there's a dip, I always say to my investors, every time there's a dip, that's the buying opportunity, go into it. But five main stocks, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, Facebook, they are Facebook, a lot of people are online. Facebook has a lot of other uh, products that they offer. So such as WhatsApp, they own Instagram, Alphabet, which is the parent company of Google. Google is into everything, AI, deliveries, search engines, so on and so forth. Amazon as well. It's a, that little startup that started off 25 years ago and it's one of the largest companies in the world, Microsoft, Apple. So those five main companies on the S&P 500, they represented more than the other 495 companies on the S&P 500. So if you're investing into an S&P ETF, most of the investment goes towards these companies. They represent a huge chunk of your portfolio. So if you want to include that in your portfolio, these are the companies that you should be including in your portfolio. And this is why most of the weight it was so much towards those tech companies, there was, for, there was a huge rally in the stock market. As I always maintain, as I always maintain myself and yourself, Mauro, always diversify the portfolio. Don't necessarily just go out and buy all the stocks. Don't put your life savings into all these stocks. Have a diversified portfolio, but make sure that you're focusing on the tech industry as well. So this is why I believe that the stock market rallied in the last six months or so. Now I want to talk about different business opportunities emerging, not just necessarily from stock market or investing. Investing is not necessarily just stock markets or buying bonds or keeping cash or like a savings account, so on and so forth. There are a lot of different business opportunities. And I want to focus on Indonesia. I've been here for a month now. I've been studying the market, understanding the market. A lot of people, understand and claim Indonesia has to be a tourist country, one of those poor countries in Southeast Asia, and they consider Bali as Indonesia or something. They believe the beaches are quite nice. They like the hospitality. They like the hotels. They like those villas in Bali. But there's more to Indonesia than just Bali, the villas, the food or whatever, you know? At the end of the day, Indonesia has experienced a steady growth of 5.8% GDP. Now, 5.8% GDP for a country of 270 million people is a huge chunk then it's one of those economies it's the seventh largest consumer economy in the world 
in terms of buying power. So we have China, the US, the EU, India. Now they are major, major countries. India has 1.3 billion people, so does China. There are huge economies in the world, but then Indonesia with 270 million people is the seventh largest. People in Indonesia have money and they want to spend money. The culture here is if you have money, you have to spend that money. Yes, Chinese people also spend a lot of money, but Indonesians spend quite a lot proportion to their economy and to their income levels. So I want to do you think that, uh, sorry, yes. do, do you think that uh, Indonesia is now at the stage that China were, let's say, 10 years ago? I wouldn't necessarily say so because I would believe that India is probably at that stage where China was 10, 15 years ago. So I would say in Indonesia is probably 20 years behind China in terms of technological growth and in terms of overall infrastructure, infrastructural growth. But India and Indonesia, those two I countries represent a huge portion of the world economy going forward in the future in terms of business opportunities that those are the two countries that nobody should bat an eyelid and they shouldn't miss that opportunity. So people who have missed the board for China, I would recommend Indonesia and India. So yes, it is huge, but then because the population is much smaller compared to India or China, there's still a long way to go. But yes, it's not far behind. And take into consideration, 15 years in business terms is not a lot. We have Amazon that started off in 1994. 1997, 1998, it had its IPO in 98 and 99, I believe, 97 and 98. And look where Amazon is right now after 20, 22 years. So it takes time, good things, you know, it takes time for things to prosper and grow. E-commerce is a huge industry across the globe. And I want to focus on e-commerce, the travel and tourism and the manufacturing and the infrastructure. The reason I mentioned infrastructure is because Indonesia is in that stage, as I mentioned about China, 15 years, what China was, they're investing heavily into their infrastructure, namely your airports, your roads, your rail network. Therefore, there's a huge opportunity for the economic growth being fueled by that infrastructural growth. If you're one of those construction companies or an art architectural firm, there are lots of opportunities available for you in terms of land, buildings, so on and so forth, when Indonesia is fueling its economy by investing into its infrastructure. Then we have manufacturing as well. After the trade war, a lot of American companies were suffering. There's also an article on Bloomberg recently how China fueled the trade war and made America pay for it. Therefore, there was a time when America was actually, because of all the tariffs and taxes, Americans were paying to import goods into their country more than they were what they have paid because of the tariffs implemented by their own government. So a lot of companies moved their manufacturing base from China into India, Vietnam, Indonesia. A lot of textile industries gone to Thailand and Cambodia these days from China. China is suffering heavily when it comes to textile industry investments and textile industry overall. Yes, China is still the world, it's considered the world's factory, but there's lots of opportunities, especially with the president, current president of Indonesia, Jokowi, when he took, an off, took office in 2014, he said that he's going to focus heavily on infrastructure development and he prioritized that. They're spending roughly about 404 million Indonesian rupees onto infrastructure projects. Now that's a lot of money for Indonesia. Might not sound a lot in dollar terms, but it is one of those that there's a huge opportunity. Travel and tourism, I believe, because Indonesia offers visa-free access to 169 countries across the globe. Yes, we're living in pandemic times, we're living in COVID-19 times, a lot of borders are closed, Indonesian borders being closed as well, unless you have a sponsor in Indonesia who's willing to offer you the sponsorship and be able to enter the country. To get into the country, it's not as easy as it seems. However, after the pandemic is over, a lot of people still get the visa-free access into Indonesia and then a lot of tourists are coming in who need more and more opportunities. A lot of people want to go and explore Indonesia and they want to see a lot of things which others haven't seen. Uh, touristy places, points of interest, which are not necessarily available on the internet, not available on Google or TripAdvisor. They want to focus on authentic travel experience. So after the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s going forward, Indonesia is relying heavily on its tourism industry to prop up its economy. There's a lot of opportunities available for foreigners in Bali, Lombok, Jakarta, Surabaya, so many cities. 
Java Island itself mainly where people can come in, invest into the travel and tourism industries and get growth. E-commerce is huge across the globe and Indonesia is one of them. A lot of people like the convenience of ordering their parcels online, just like as in China. So we have Taobao in China, eBay in the US and Amazon and all that. But because of cheap labor in Southeast Asian countries, you know yourself, Mauro, ordering from Taobao and in Indonesia, it's called Tokopedia, it's so convenient. For example, like Amazon Prime might offer 15 minute delivery in Canada or US, but when it comes to the UK or U, uh, Europe, it's two or three days. Whereas in, I remember in Shanghai, I ordered myself a hard drive from Taobao. I ordered at lunchtime, and by the time I got home, it was at my door. So that's the convenience and that's the beauty of cheap labor in the Southeast Asian countries. Companies, multinational conglomerates are able to offer, huge multi billion dollar conglomerates are able to offer services that may not necessarily be available due to other logistical uh, barriers in other European or the US, for example, European countries. Due to the huge population in Indonesia of 270 million people, they're saying that roughly about 10 million people are tourists. Now, these tourists don't necessarily speak the local language. E-commerce opportunities are available to those tourists who necessarily want to come to Indonesia for maybe a month, two weeks, they need goods in and out. If you're able to provide a service, that's an opportunity. Opportunities are here in Indonesia. I'm picking on Indonesia because I've been studying the market myself. And if you want to come into Indonesia, if you want to invest into Indonesia, feel free to contact myself. I'll be able to provide you a detailed consultancy of how to enter the market, what kind of businesses to do, I'll be able to draft a business proposal for yourself regarding your requirements and the budgets and the inf uh, investment that you have and we'll be able to come up with something. But there are more other opportunities available in Indonesia. Yes, China is one of those bigger economies and there's a huge market. But just because China is huge doesn't mean that you overlook China or other uh, overlook other countries such as Indonesia for the sake of entering the, one of the largest markets in the world. So I believe have a broader vision, have a broader horizon. If you want growth, if you want to grow your business, if you want to fuel your business, look into Indonesia. Can't agree more. Yeah. Anything else? But even from China, you know, uh, it's important to diversify, as we always say, uh, and look uh, look around. Uh, definitely, there is. Uh, I have nothing to add on uh, on this perfect i just want to ask a question regarding your topic Mauro. so eu and china i read on bloomberg maybe about four months ago or something that eu and china trade on average of 1 billion euros a day now 1 billion euros might sound a lot of money but to be honest in terms of the context of the populations and all we're talking about 1.4 billion in china roughly 450 million people in the eu that's quite a small number of 1 billion euros a day of trade between those two economies like EU as an economy and China. Why do you think that EU and China trade so low compared to what China does with the US or China does with India or China does with Pakistan or all these other, Australia for even? Well, I think it's a, um, a problem. Uh, this comes basically from, from structural problems of um, especially of the European economy. Uh, especially we can see that uh, most uh, of the figures, uh, most uh, the vast majority of this one billion that you mentioned actually is uh, mainly um, the production that happens in China and arrives uh, in the EU. In fact, it's only Germany that has a trade surplus, ah. like dividing, uh, dividing Europe uh, be within uh, between the 27, 28 countries. Uh, we can so far we can still include the UK yes. inside it. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, all of these countries uh, have uh, a deficit uh, in trade uh, towards China. The only country that does not uh, is Germany. This mostly because of the automotive industry that, of course, is the, um, the, the strongest point um, of, uh, of the German economy towards the world. Um, and this uh, is basically the result of it because outside Germany, 
um, the, the other countries uh, rarely have uh, the infrastructure, the um, basically the uh, right conglomerate uh, uh, of companies, uh, um, of big companies that can actually face uh, the Chinese market uh, effectively. This is the big problem, right. especially, for example, in Italy, where I'm from, most mm-hmm. of the economy is made of small and medium enterprises. Yes. It's extremely hard to come to China and do serious Compete. business yes. if, uh, if you are still too small. If the problem uh, the problem here is that uh, until uh, uh, we don't create uh, uh, conglomerates uh, that can actually access uh, a market that is so complex uh, we will never uh, uh, fill this gap so um, I hope that after the pandemic this can be an occasion uh, yeah. to uh, an opportunity to actually put the, the strength together yes. and face the market in the right way. I agree, I agree. And as you mentioned regarding a small business, I'll just wrap it up here as well with you tomorrow. Yes, Italy represents a lot of Italian economy represents uh, sorry, a lot of the it, small businesses uh, represent a huge portion of the Italian economy. And it is very difficult for those small owners, small enterprise owners, not just in Italy, but also across all of the EU, even in Ireland as well, for them to be able to hop on a plane, even after the pandemic, to come to China and compete with these huge conglomerates. So I believe that the government, like, you know, government, the European government may necessarily provide the system or may necessarily provide the infrastructure or the support to small businesses, the loan agreements and all so on and so forth within the country, jurisdiction of the country, but when they want to expand abroad, it's very difficult for them to air. And I hope that this trade agreement, this comprehensive agreement with the EU and China maybe narrows that approach down and a lot of the companies are able to uh, enter China, a lot of the companies are able to do business directly, but I believe it's still a long way to go. We live in such competitive world right now that it's very difficult to do business. So to come along and just focus on a huge market, that's why many people, like a lot of my clients have this mistake and I feel like, and that's why I try to, when my consultants, I try to explain to them. And uh, I say to them that as much as you want to enter China, but maybe you don't necessarily have that infrastructure yet to enter the Chinese market, the other opportunities available where they are able to grow at a substantial rate. And once they're grown in those markets, then they go into the Chinese market. The market is already laid out. There's uh, enough capital inflow and they're able to utilize the capital to invest and grow their business into major markets. Anyhow, I believe we'll just wrap it here, Mauro. Thanks for your insight. Thank you so much for your time. I'll see you again next week. And once again, it's always nice of you to be on my channel. Thank you. Thank you, Rishi. And see you next week. Feel see free week. Uh, to to share my contacts uh, and uh, for, sure. for our watchers uh, to uh, have a chat. Uh, Indeed. Uh, have a chat with us anytime. Indeed. See you next week. See you next week. Bye bye.